dog in the background. Um, welcome to the Gavin Herberta Eye Institute lecture on aging eyes. Um, tonight you're going to hear from Dr. Kavita Rao on how your eyes age and from Dr. Sanjay Kadar on how your eyes relate to illnesses of the body. So we'll be um, taking questions at the end of both of the lectures. And um, we'd like to keep the questions as general as possible and not revealing any of your personal medical information. You can also put the questions in the chat and we will ask the doctors at the end of the lecture, the questions that come in the chat. So with that, I'm gonna mute myself and my dog and introduce Dr. Rao. Hello. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you just fine. So I'm Dr. Rao. I'm one of the general ophthalmologists here at UCI uh, at Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. I've been here since 2016. Um, and I deal with all of the general ophthalmology issues that come up. Um, if it needs to be seen by a specialist, I send them to see the specific specialist at our institute. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple topics that I think are very basic what I see day to day and that you guys might be expecting to see as you get older, which all of us eventually are going to be getting older. So it's all diseases that you would see um, in the general population. So the topics that I chose to cover are macular degeneration, glaucoma, and cataract. These are all processes that we see as the eye naturally gets older. Some of them we see more prevalent in um, people that are predisposed to genetic conditions, but some of them are just part of diseases we see as the eye gets older. So vision loss in the elderly. Um, so statistics have shown that one out of three have some visual loss by age 65. And just some of the general things that I see with patients are they complain or they tell me that their daily activities, um, they can't do them as good as they normally used to, such as reading, they need more light, um, they can't see as well, they need magnifying glasses. Um, some people become depressed and I mean, vision is a daily thing that we use with all things. So it becomes very depressing if we can't see what we're normally used to seeing. Um, people get less mobility, obviously, they can't see things, they fall and they get fractures and you lose your sense of independent living. You become more reliant on other things, other people to help you, obviously, if you can't see as well. So just to give you some sense of statistics, at 80 years old, your chance of having a cataract is 68%. Uh, macular degeneration, 35%, and glaucoma, 8%. This is a very kind of rough estimate, but in general, as everyone gets older, pretty much all of my patients past the age of 65 have some form of cataract. So uh, visual impairment often untreated, meaning um, these are things that often if we catch early on, we can prevent blindness, um, and we can also prevent um, other complications such as um, glaucoma. We can, if we catch it early, we can prevent people from getting advanced glaucoma, which can ultimately prevent blindness. Um, unoperated cataract, obviously, if we can treat that early on, we can save complications that might happen if we wait till the cataract is very advanced. Um, also, cataract can cause blindness in itself, so we can treat all these things if we find them early on. So first I'm gonna talk about age-related macular degeneration. You guys might've heard about this topic, but it's the most common cause of vision loss in elderly. So in macular degeneration, we get a loss of the central vision. So the periphery remains intact, but your central part of the vision becomes affected. Um, some of the risk factors include obviously advanced age, um, genetics has a lot to do with it, fair skin, uh, Caucasian ethnicity, unfortunately, has a higher rate of macular degeneration, um, smoking, and heart disease. 
So this is a picture of the back of your eye or what we call the retina. And when we look into people's eyes, we can actually see these yellow deposits, which we call drusen. Um, they're proteinaceous type deposits that we see that form in the early stages of macular degeneration. So this is the dry kind of macular degeneration, the dry and the wet. So these deposits we usually see in the dry kind. But macular degeneration or AMD, age-related macular degeneration, is a progressive disease. So what I showed you in the slide right before this, there were little yellow deposits, which are early in the disease process, but it can change into this neovascular um, kind where these blood vessels grow in the back of the retina, but the blood vessels are not normal. They break and they bleed. So we can get bleeding in the retina once the bleeding resolves, we're left with the scar, which is unfortunately permanent and it can cause permanent vision loss um, and blindness. So this little graph, or it's called an Amsler grid, which I give a lot of my patients, is a little test we tell patients to do at home. So you cover one eye and you look at the little dot in the middle, and we want to make sure all the lines are straight and all the lines are present. So in people with macular degeneration that have changes in the back of the retina, they might say in this slide, oh, this area is distorted or it's not straight, it's crooked, it's wavy. And then it's actually very specific for telling us that something is going on in the macula or the part of the retina where I showed you guys in the previous slide where macular degeneration um, affects. So this is just a picture in general of normal. This is a normal view of person with normal vision, no macular degeneration. And in macular degeneration, the central vision is affected. So the picture might look like this to someone. So the center is all blurry, but the periphery remains um, pretty much intact. So symptoms of macular degeneration early on, people might complain of difficulty driving. Um, like I mentioned, straight lines may appear more wavy or distorted. But in advanced disease, you get that central blind spot um, where that picture I showed you where it's just very uh, blurry and centrally. The peripheral vision remains intact, um, but this really affects independent living skills. I mean, day to day, we use our central vision, probably like 90% of our vision is that. So independent living skills become um, very difficult to do. This is another picture of a test we do in our clinic for macular degeneration. It's called an OCT um, and it's a scan of the retina. And here, I won't go that much into it, but this area right here is not normal. It's some fluid that's built up under the retina. And we can tell that the macular degeneration maybe has converted into the worst kind or what we call the wet kind, um, which we can treat. So treatment for macular degeneration, so the dry kind, unfortunately we don't have specific treatment, but there are things which research has proven um, that it slows the progression of the disease. And these things include stopping smoking, controlling any heart disease or blood pressure, cholesterol issues. We tell people to eat a diet rich in green leafy vegetables, such as kale, spinach, broccoli, also fruits, um, specific antioxidants such as zinc, vitamin C, lutein. Those ingredients have shown to kind of slow the progression of the macular degeneration. Once it has converted to this wet kind where the blood vessel breaks and we get bleeding in the retina, we have treatment which includes injections into the eye and even laser, um, which can help resolve the bleeding. So another topic I wanted to cover was glaucoma. Glaucoma doesn't necessarily occur with the natural aging of the eye, but we do see it in um, more um, of the aged population. Genetics has a lot to do with the glaucoma as well though. So glaucoma is classically called the thief in the night because people don't have many symptoms until the very end. So early on, I mean, it's a painless disease. You won't notice any pain. You won't even have much vision symptoms. 
Um, you might have a subtle loss of the peripheral or side vision, um, but really, unless you're coming into the ophthalmologist and we do specific tests, you won't be able to detect that you have anything wrong with the eye. So uh, compared to macular degeneration where the center part was affected in advanced glaucoma, we see the center part is preserved and unfortunately the periphery is all affected or um, becomes blurred. So glaucoma is the second most common cause of vision loss in the elderly. In general, I would say um, African-Americans have a much higher risk than the other population. 10% um, of African-Americans over the age of 70 years old have glaucoma versus Caucasians um, have a much lower risk. So definitely in glaucoma, early detection and treatment can prevent blindness. Some risk factors of glaucoma, um, some people think if you have a high eye pressure, you automatically have glaucoma, but high eye pressure doesn't really necessarily mean glaucoma. Yeah, it puts you at a risk, but there's a lot of other things involved. Um, your ethnicity, such as African-American, advanced age, family history, hypertension, diabetes. Sometimes we also measure the thickness of the cornea or the front of the eye, which also kind of determines a risk factor for glaucoma. So in general, um, why, what the cause of glaucoma is, there's fluid which is created in the eye and normally this fluid has a lot of nutrients in it. It bathes a lot of the structures of the eye, but the fluid, it exits out of the eye through a drainage channel. Um, glaucoma happens because this fluid builds up and the fluid is not able to leave. So the pressure builds up and the high pressure um, causes damage to your nerve, which is in the back of the eye. So a simple analogy is it's just kind of like coffee grounds blocking the sink drain. There's no exit pathway and the pressure builds up and affects certain structures. Um, also kind of like um, the cable carrying vision signals to the brain. The cable is our optic nerve, which connects to the back of the brain. So this cable gets damaged and then the brain isn't allowed to function and provide vision. So when we look into the back of the eye, this is how the nerves look in everybody. And you can tell on the right side, this white part of the eye, which we call the cup of the nerve is very small. But if you look here on the left, the white part is much larger. So we call that cupping, um, or this can happen, damage has occurred to the nerve. So the cup actually gets larger and we can actually see that in the eye. The, the nerve starts to look different. And this is much larger than this, which is in glaucoma what we see. So two types of glaucoma, there's open, not two types, I should say the two most common types of glaucoma um, that we deal with are open angle glaucoma, which is the most common in the elderly and there's angle closure glaucoma. So this is a little diagram. Um, when I mentioned that there's fluid created in the eye, this arrow, this arrow depicting um, fluid outflow. So fluid is created, what they call aqueous fluid over here. And it's supposed to go this way and then it exit out these little drainage channels. Um, so in glaucoma, the drainage channels are affected or blocked and the fluid builds up all in the eye. So you guys, some of you might uh, be familiar with this test. It's a visual field testing, and we do it to test the periphery in glaucoma, which is what is mostly affected. Um, so you sit in this machine and you focus on a specific light and you see little lights go off in your periphery and you have to push the button when you see a light. So it's actually very specific and sensitive for any changes or detection of glaucoma. So we have medical treatment for glaucoma and the goals of the medical treatment obviously are we wanna prevent vision field loss. So the periphery field that we get lost in glaucoma, um, we wanna prevent damage to the optic nerve in the eye. Um, initially we use medications such as eye drop to lower the eye pressure as this is one thing that has known to that we're able to treat. Um, we're able to treat the pressure. So we use medications which help lower the pressure. And then we do the field test and we assess 
the optic nerve damage a couple times a year. Um, if we see any changes in that test or another type of test that we know we have to add more things to the treatment, we have to do something else. So besides medications or eye drops, we have laser surgery. There is eye surgery itself, which we do in the operating room, such as filtering surgery. We can place drainage devices that help drain the fluid. Um, and these are all different types of uh, surgical treatments of glaucoma, which we have. And in the, this day and age of glaucoma, there's lots of um, research being done and lots of new devices and treatment, which we didn't have even five, six years ago. So we have a lot of new technology. The last topic to be covered is a cataract, which in my opinion is pretty much like um, most of what I see day, um, every day. And really um, people ask, what can you do to prevent cataract? But if you get older and older, I'm, I tell people, if you live until hundred years old, guarantee you're gonna have some form of cataract. But cataract is um, aging of your lens in the eye. Basically the lens is supposed to be clear. And as we get older, it starts to become more yellow. So when it becomes yellow, if you can imagine trying to look through a yellow lens, um, color discrimination becomes difficult. Um, we don't see contrast as well. So the lens opacifies, um, it's not clear anymore, it hardens and we get this loss of accommodation or presbyopa, which we call. So after age 50, everybody needs reading glasses because the lens becomes hard and rigid and it's not able to focus anymore for up close. So that is what this presbyopia is. So cataract is natural cloudiness of the lens where it used to be clear, it becomes more yellowish and cloudy. Um, there's over 2 million cataract surgeries in the US every year. And it's the third most common cause of blindness. This is just a diagram of the eye. So if this were the front of the eye right here, this is the back of the eye. This is that nerve that I was showing you guys with glaucoma and this is the retina. And the lens kind of sits more closer to the front of the eye. So it's right behind this colored structure which we call the iris. So this is just a diagram showing you what happens with the cataract. So as the lens becomes cloudy, this is normally what you would see, but as the lens becomes cloudy, you get this reduced contrast sensitivity. It's almost like there's a film over the eye and you can't see colors as well. Um, at nighttime, a lot of patients will say they, they're seeing more glare or halos, especially with the cars coming towards you. Um, you can see the halos right here from the headlights and it's, it's very disturbing and you can't, it's difficult to drive at night. So what is a cataract? Again, it's just opacification or clouding of the lens. This causes poor focusing and scattering of the light, which is supposed to go to, through to the back of the eye. Um, so in 90% of cases, this is just a general consequence of getting older as the eye gets older. But other, um, there are other risk factors such as diabetes. We see cataracts a lot sooner. Um, if you've been hit in the eye or any sort of trauma that can cause the cataract to come on sooner. Certain people that are on steroids or certain medications, um, we see the cataract come on a lot of sooner as well. So symptoms, I discussed a little bit of this. Um, you get some glare at night. Uh, you need more light to get into the eye to see through that brown or yellow lens. So needing more light is very common and just a general kind of haziness or film you don't see as crisp and sharp. So it's a progressive vision loss. A cataract usually doesn't develop overnight. Every year, it'll slowly get a little worse. Um, and the type of cataract you have or the size of the um, brunescence or brownness of it kind of determines how much of a vision impairment you might have. So we do surgery basically when the patient tells us, oh, it's impairing their vision, they can't see as well, they can't do the things they like to do every day, such as reading, driving, they can't um, watch their television shows that they like to do. So unfortunately, there's no current medical treatment, but usually if the patient is not bothered by the symptoms, um, I'd usually wait and I won't send them to my cataract colleague unless they say, oh, glasses aren't helping me and it's really bothering me. I can't see as well anymore. 
So cataract surgery in the 1980s versus 2009, or even now, um, back then you would have to stay in the hospital. It was an inpatient procedure. Now it's outpatient. You go home the same day, we put an eye patch over that eye, we tell you to use some eye drops for a couple weeks, but you don't need to stay in the hospital. Um, back then there was about longer recovery time, maybe two months. Now, because of technology and the way they do the surgery, um, we're able to get much quicker, immediate, useful vision. Um, the next day, usually we see people in clinic and they can see pretty well. Um, so it's not back like how it was back in the 80s. Um, back then also we needed thick glasses um, or contact lenses after the cataract surgery. Sometimes they weren't able to implant a lens or they didn't even have the idea of an artificial lens. And these days we have artificial intraocular lenses that we put in the eye. So we don't, the goal is um, hopefully you won't wear much glasses after the surgery. You won't need to wear them for most of your activities. So this is just a diagram of the surgery itself. Basically we use a little instrument. Um, it's kind of like suctioning out the lens, but we have to make a little incision. We go into the eye and we kind of slowly vacuum out the lens or the cataract, which is what it is. And then we put in right here an artificial lens. So that artificial lens is permanent. Um, you never need to put in a new lens after that unless obviously something happens or there's some complication, but that lens is meant to be there permanently. And this is how it looks from the side view. Um, this is where that lens sits. So outcomes and complications, about 90% of patients will see 20, 40 or better. Um, there are complications, of course, it is a surgery. Um, so there's always a risk of infection, pain, um, God forbid, loss of eye is, um, is a complication, but this day and age, it usually those kinds of things don't happen. Um, you, we usually we might see a little high eye pressure, which happens the next day or the next couple weeks or so. You can also get a retinal issue um, after surgery, but the risk is pretty low. The most common complication, it's not a complication per se, but I tell people it's because we put this artificial lens in the eye and your own cells in the body or that are left behind from the surgery start to grow on that lens. So it's like a secondary film or a secondary cataract that we fix very easily in clinic. We do a little laser to clean off that lens um, and that film will never grow back again. So at Gavin Herbert today, um, we have about, I wanna say it's actually more than 15, probably around 20 ophthalmologists that are in range of different specialties. So it's nice because we have our whole clinic that we have all these specialists that you don't, you can see whoever you need to see and just come to our um, building. So it is very nice. Um, we have the most experienced team of doctors that are very well trained. Um, you get the newest um, technology and most advanced clinical research that we have going on applied to the medical treatment that you get. This is just a nice picture of our very nice building. And some take home points. So there are new treatment options for macular degeneration. Um, this is ongoing research that we're doing here at UCI. Um, it is very important that if you have any family history of glaucoma or any family history of eye disease, just come in and see us. We can take a look because you might not be having any symptoms, but we can see it when we look in your eye. Um, and in terms of cataract, we have a lot of advances, a lot of different types of lenses we can put in the eye, a um, lot of cool technology. So um, Gavin Herbert is really at the forefront of all this technology. And um, I'm biased, obviously, because I work here. But I mean, if I needed any eye treatment, I would definitely come here. It's an amazing place. Um, I hope you guys learned something from my lecture, but if you do want to come see us, our number is right here. I'm more than happy to see you. And if you have any questions, we're leaving questions open for um, at the end of the lecture. So I'm going to pass on the lecture to my colleague, Dr. Kidar, who is on here. Great. Uh Thank you, Kavita. And I think that's really just an excellent sort of overview of, of a lot of the very common 
uh, diseases that affect uh, many of our patients and probably the ones that uh, many of the people in the audience are most uh, commonly familiar with and, and may be af afflicted by. Uh, myself, uh, my name is Sandra Kedar. I'm a professor of ophthalmology here at University of California, Irvine. I've been here for about five years. Uh, before this, I was on the faculty at um, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and prior to that at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Uh, and many people ask me why I returned here or why I came here from the East Coast, but I'm actually originally an Irvine. Uh, I, was, I was here before the city was incorporated. I grew up here when it was still strawberry fields and orange, uh, orange fields, uh, or orange groves rather. And um, yeah, just wanted to come back home. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy that there is an institution like uh, Gavin Herbert here for us and for the community. And uh, I'm really happy to see that uh, my hometown has grown into, into such a large sort of metropolitan type city. In any case, the um, lecture I'd like to give to you today with the remaining time that we have here is about how the eye is involved in systemic disease. And these are my um, relevant disclosures here. I'm a consultant for uh, Vices Therapeutics. So eye disease, uh, it's interesting that both, you know, we often hear at times hear the words that the eyes are the windows to the soul. And in fact, uh, the eyes can tell us a lot about your general health. Uh, many patients uh, may have diseases that show manifestations in the eyes and that are only picked up first when the eyes are examined. And vice versa, there are many patients who develop systemic diseases that then can manifest as eye problems. And so there's this sort of back and forth between both the eye disease and systemic disease, and we can really see a lot of uh, interaction there. So broadly, for the purposes of this talk, I usually like to categorize systemic diseases. So we see things as congenital, meaning that they're present from birth. Uh, traumatic uh, events can also cause ocular problems or eye problems vascular problems, so things like high blood pressure or cholesterol can also cause problems in the eyes. We talk about autoimmune diseases. These are diseases wherein your immune system attacks various organs or other parts of your body. These would be things most of you may be familiar with, uh, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, which affects the joints, or lupus, which can affect multiple different organ systems. There are also infectious diseases that can affect the eyes. Uh, Lyme disease being one of them, West Nile virus, uh, many of you have heard of, can also cause eye problems as well. Um, include, and also more rare diseases, things like syphilis or tuberculosis can also cause eye problems. Probably one of the most common diseases that we see, uh, where we see actually diseases in, or manifestations in the eye, are metabolic syndromes. So things like diabetes, that's probably one of, one of the most common uh, reasons that we are examining patients and reasons why uh, Dr. Rao is, is consulted for examining them. Uh, the other conditions include things like certain kinds of medications, especially uh, now uh, things like the newer medications that treat uh, cancer, certain chemotherapies can have uh, adverse events on the eyes. There are also other drugs which are used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, one drug that's been in the news in the last year called Plaquenil, uh, or hydroxychloroquine that can also actually cause uh, toxicity to the retina. Um, and then neoplastic disease, or what we mean by that is cancer, certain cancers that can manifest elsewhere in the body and can, can metastasize to the eye and vice versa. Sometimes we can see that there are certain cancers that manifest in the eye first. So things like lymphoma, for instance, may, may first show up in the eye and then later over the next five years progress towards the central nervous system or the brain. Now, uh, given the fact that we only have about half an hour, I don't have time to talk about all of these categories, but I wanted to focus on the ones that may be most relevant to the audience today. Uh, certainly, as I've mentioned before, diabetes is one of those uh, categories. So metabolic and endocrine diseases. Uh, within vascular disease, high blood pressure, hypertension, or embolic disease. So many people have high cholesterol, they're at risk for stroke, uh, and so those things can also affect the eyes. And lastly, I'll discuss autoimmune diseases. So these are things most commonly, many of you have heard of rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. There's also a disease called sarcoidosis, which can affect many of the organs in the body. Uh, 
um, and we'll go over some of the manifestations of those diseases in the eye. So let's talk about diabetic eye disease first. Um, vision loss and diabetes can occur due to a number of different conditions. So certainly some of the more common reasons are cataracts and these occur uh, in, as, as uh, Kavitha, as Dr. Rao explained earlier, most patients, if, if they live long enough, you're gonna have cataracts, right? It's, it's sort of like death and taxes. Everyone's gonna get them at some point. Uh, but patients with diabetes do tend to get these cataracts earlier. And oftentimes we may find patients uh, fairly young, certainly in their 30s or 40s that are developing cataracts. Whereas patients that develop age-related cataracts, we not, might not expect to see those being very significant to their vision until they're in their 60s to 80s. Likewise, if it, diabetes can cause a lack or a decrease in blood flow to certain parts of the eye, and that's known as ischemia, and ischemia can cause problems for the eye. In fact, the retina in the eye, uh, which is in the back part of the eye, and I'll show you a diagram uh, shortly, but the retina actually is a very metabolically active tissue, and what that means is that it's constant, it needs a fairly brisk uh, level of blood flow or a good level of blood flow in order for it to function properly. And much like the brain, the retina is neuronal tissue similar to the brain. Uh, if it doesn't get that blood flow, it can uh, not function properly. And so diabetes can cause a decrease in blood flow to the retina and that can cause uh, loss of vision. When there's loss of blood flow, the eye responds by trying to grow new blood vessels. So this is called, uh, you can get neovascularization. You can get these blood vessels growing in multiple areas of the body, including the retina, uh, the optic nerve, but you can also get it to grow in that drainage canal that Dr. Rao was explaining about earlier. Now, if those vessels grow in that area, sometimes they'll break, they'll bleed, or they'll cause uh, scarring over that canal, and that can actually decrease the amount of, of um, fluid that's flowing out of the eye, and that will cause an increase in the pressure. The increase in the pressure can then subsequently cause damage to the optic nerve, and that can cause a loss of vision. So uh, what we'd like to do in most of these situations is try to sort of head it off at the pass, right? We want to alleviate or prevent any of these things from happening, because if they do happen, certainly we have treatments for them, but it's always better to, prevention is always better. Um, uh, an ounce of prevention is where the pound of cure is, they say. Diabetic retinopathy, which is, means that diabetes is affecting the retina, uh, can occur and manifest in a several different uh, ways. One is through swelling in the retina. Another one is through bleeding, something called vitreous hemorrhage. And lastly, through traction uh, or pulling on the retina. And this can ultimately resolve in a, or result rather, in a uh, retinal detachment. So diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in working age people in the United States. Um, in general, our goal is for patients to have a hemoglobin A1C of less than seven. So this is hemoglobin A1C, for those that are not familiar, is basically like an average of your blood sugars over, say, about three months. And it gives us a general sense. Rather than taking your blood sugar at any one point in time, this gives us an average over a longer period of time, which gives us a better understanding of how your blood sugars are doing. We also ask that patients control blood pressure, don't smoke, and control their cholesterol because all of these things can also uh, interact and affect the development of diabetic retinopathy. What's most important here, I, I think, for patients that have diabetes and are, are looking at, well, what can I do to prevent my uh, risk of diabetic retinopathy? Well, if you lower your hemoglobin A1C, so this is better control of the blood sugars, for every point that you reduce your hemoglobin A1C, you reduce your risk of retinopathy by 35%. And in fact, when we've done long-term studies of patients with diabetes, and we put them into a group where we had tight blood pressure control versus ones that we didn't as tightly control the blood sugar, what we found is that the people in the, in the first group who had the tight control of the blood sugar, who really were adherent to the regimen and, and followed through with all of our uh, um, recommendations for control of the, of the blood sugars, those patients reduce their risk of retinopathy and complications by about 75%. So this is a really good motivator, I feel like, for many patients with diabetes that better control of your blood sugar is going to protect your eyes in the long run, all right? This is going to prevent you from going blind. 
what happens in diabetes is that the lining of the blood vessels in the eye become damaged. And so then the blood vessels slowly start to leak fluid into the retina, which causes it to swell. This may then result in blurred vision. In addition, as I mentioned before, the body will try to grow new blood vessels to compensate for the um, fact that these old blood vessels that are damaged are not carrying as much blood or oxygen to the tissues. When these new blood vessels form, they're never as good as the original blood vessels that you had, and they tend to breathe, break and bleed, which then can cause damage to the retina, and even more loss of vision. So what are the symptoms? How do you know if you have diabetic retinopathy? Well, you might not know and, until it becomes more advanced. So in general, we advise that patients that have diabetes get checked with a diabetic retina exam, meaning that their eyes are dilated, the retina is examined once a year. If they don't have any retinopathy, if they have no problems, certainly once a year is reasonable. If they have some degree of retinopathy, then we want to see them more frequently during the year. And that can range anywhere from every month to every three months to every six months really depends on the severity. Um, but the important thing is that you shouldn't skip just a general exam just because you're feeling good. There's usually no pain. And early on, as I said before, you might not notice any decreased vision. Um, over time, however, as the disease becomes more advanced, you might have blurred vision. You may notice distorted vision. So as the retina swells, it's not flat anymore. It forms a curve which then straight lines when you're looking at them, say the edge of a doorway, for instance, or the edge of a piece of paper or your computer monitor, those may then become slightly curved, which gives you an indication that there's fluid in the retina or there may be fluid in the retina and that this may be uh, the diabetic retinopathy getting worse. Symptoms can occur both gradually or suddenly. So in other words, you may have, if the, those blood vessels bleed, then you can all of a sudden lose vision or if you're slowly getting fluid that's leaking into the retina and that's swelling, you might then have more of a gradual development of blurred vision. And it is possible to go blind from diabetic retinopathy. It's very, very important that you see an ophthalmologist that can examine you and look for any problems. And if these are developing, then the next step is actually to see a retina specialist where we have many treatments that can then stop the diabetic retinopathy or prevent it from getting worse. So there are, we classify diabetic retinopathy into multiple different um, types. Specifically, we look at something called non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And in this context, proliferative really means that the growth of new blood vessels or neovascularization. So as we talked about before, um, I think the most important treatment really is prevention control your blood sugar, your blood pressure. And in fact, the studies I mentioned about the reduction in the risk of retinopathy with controlled blood sugar, with blood pressure control, you can actually reduce your, retina, your risk of retinopathy by 50%. Controlling cholesterol and absolutely do not smoke. Uh, this seems to be less and less of an issue as we go on, which we're thankful for, but still, uh, if you are uh, in a home where you're smoking or someone else is smoking, um, really this is, is one of the worst things you can do for your eyes, not only for diabetes, but also for macular degeneration, as well as for the rest of your health. With, we can also treat uh, diabetic retinopathy with injections of medicine into the eyes, lasers, as well as surgery. And I'll go over some of those as we go on. This is a basic schematic of the eye. As you can see in the front here, I'll try to bring my cursor, you can see the cornea. This is the pupil, the iris. This is the lens of the eye, which is, forms a cataract over time. And then behind that here, you see the retina and the optic nerve. The retina is like film in a camera, it gathers the image and then transmits it through the optic nerve as Dr. Rao mentioned before. Um, and then we have the vitreous, which is the gel in the middle of it. So this is a normal eye, a normal retina. When your doctor is looking in your eye, this is what they're seeing here. And they're seeing the optic nerve as well as the blood vessels. And the, the background sort of orange color here is the retina. In non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we might see hemorrhages. So we see a few here as indicated by the arrow, small areas of bleeding um, as the blood vessels become incompetent. You may also then see exudates. And what, this are, what these are, are as the fluid leaks out of these incompetent vessels, 
you'll, uh, it leaves behind cholesterol and fat, and that kind of deposits here in the retina. So when we start seeing this, we immediately know, especially if we see a circle like that, we know that somewhere in the center, there is a leaking blood vessel there because it's leaking fluid in all directions. This is uh, from a fluorescein angiogram. So your doctor may inject some dye through a vein and then shoot progressive pictures of your uh, retina to see how the dye is going through the blood vessels here. As the blood vessel travel, as the dye travels through blood vessels, it may leak, which indicates that the blood vessels are not um, competent and may be affected by diabetes. You might also see these white spots, which represent little outpouchings of the blood vessel wall. As we said, the lining of the blood vessels is affected, and as that gets affected, you might get these little outpouchings. And so those are called microaneurysms. We might also see ischemia, which we mentioned was no blood flow. So as you can see here, this area is darker than some of these areas here where you're seeing the dye. That means that the dye is not getting into this area. Uh, and so the blood vessels are not flowing into this area to allow the dye to go forward. We may also see swelling, so leakage of the fluid into these areas, the central part of the retina called the macula, and that can cause blurred vision. We now have a, a remarkable instrument, which is called the OCT or optical coherence tomography. And OCT has allowed us to actually get a view of the retina that's equivalent to, or fairly equivalent to looking at it under a microscope where we can see individual cell layers. And this can all be done without you know, removing the eye or doing any kind of surgery. We can actually visualize this within your eye. And what we're seeing here is a side view of the retina. The lower photo shows us the normal layers. You can see these stripes. Each stripe is sort of a layer of the retina. And normally there's a depression here or a center called the fovea, which is where your central vision comes from. As the fluid leaks there, you'll see that instead of this central depression or valley, we start to get a mountain. So we start to see that there's more fluid in the eye um, and that it's, it's thickening. And that can actually result in uh, more blurred vision. Again, this is called diabetic macular edema, edema meaning, uh, meaning accumulation of fluid or swelling. So when we have these kinds of problems, oftentimes uh, we resort to injections of medication into the eye. And there are several places you might seem scary, like where are we injecting, what are we doing? But there are several different areas that we might inject into the eye. One area is the pars plana, so we actually will inject through the eye wall here into the center. And the idea is that we deposit medication in the center of the eye and it distributes itself into the retina to help reduce diabetic retinopathy. We may also inject around the eye, just sort of leaving it on the outside of the eye to diffuse gradually through the wall of the eye into that center and to help with the uh, diabetic disease as well. We typically talk about what's called anti-VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor. Those are, that's the growth factor that causes those new blood vessels to grow. It can also cause leaking of the blood vessels and cause those to cause um, swelling in the retina. And there are several different drugs that are available on the market today. One is called Lucentis, another is Ilea, and another one is Avastin. Um, I think the important thing to know here is not the specific names of the drugs, but that multiple drugs are available. Uh, they can all work well. We may start with one drug, and if it's not effective, move on to one of the other drugs. Sometimes people respond to one and not another. So um, it's not important to know the names as much as it is to know that if one drug is not working, uh, you know, speak to your doctor about possibly looking into another drug that may be more effective. We can also inject steroids, and there's multiple different types of steroids that are available. Steroids have the uh, advantage of calming inflammation, but they can also help with the swelling and they can work very well. The disadvantage of steroids is that they can cause cataracts, they can cause elevation of, of eye pressure in the eye, and so, uh, or otherwise known as glaucoma. And so what we try to do is uh, reserve these for the cases that we think are more severe, ones that need it. We can use multiple different drugs. The important thing here to know is that uh, each drug has a different duration of activity. And so if one drug is working, but maybe not 
lasting long enough, we can inject a second drug here or even a third that can last for a longer period of time. Um, there's also a drug that it, same steroid as we use in the eye can be used outside the eye in that sub tenons fashion. So if we're concerned about infection risk or detachment, retinal detachment risk, we can inject around the eye and that can also be very effective. So here you see someone with very mild diabetic retinopathy, something we call type one diabetic. Uh, this is a type one diabetic with non-proliferative, excuse me, with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So this is more severe. Um, it, I may not visualize very well here on the screen, but there are new blood vessels that are growing into kind of a net in this area here. So in this patient, um, this was the patient here first who was seen with um, early proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And we can see some small areas here. These dark areas are actually a little bit of hemorrhage. So he's having some bleeding. Well, the patient was scheduled for laser. So laser therapy, what that does is we laser the retina. It actually destroys some of the cells, sort of the peripheral cell, uh, you know, parts of your retina that are, are outside of your central vision. But the idea is that it reduces the production of that growth factor, VEGF, that causes new blood vessels to grow. So by treating it with laser, we reduce the, the distress call, the distress signal from those cells, and then the new blood vessels don't grow and they don't bleed, they don't cause scarring or, or glaucoma. But this patient happened to miss their appointment. And you can see here, now we have a large area of bleeding. And at this point, this is not, uh, the eyes full of blood, the patient can't see. Uh, this is not uh, conducive to just injections or to laser. So at this point, we have to consider uh, surgery. This is an ultrasound, uh, similar to what we do when we're examining uh, pregnant women for babies. Uh, we can look at the ultrasound here, we can see the eye, this sort of opacification in the center, we can see is blood. And you know, here's another patient who has new blood vessel growth. You can see it pointed by the arrows here. And this is that fluorescein angiogram, which is showing us leakage of the dye all through this area, indicating that all those areas have blood vessels that are not very uh, competent, meaning that they're leaking, uh, indicating proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And as a result of all of these blood vessels, I told you that the blood vessels can bring with them some scar tissue, what they call fibrovascular membranes. And these can pull on the retina. As you can see here, this is the membrane and the membrane's pulling on the retina. It's causing swelling, but ultimately it can actually cause a detachment of the retina. And so in this patient, um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Mittal Mehta, who's a really excellent uh, retina surgeon here, we have a, a very nice team uh, that's able to handle all of these diseases uh, with great skill. And uh, you can see that he's actually successfully repealed all those membranes off, allowed the retina to uh, relax into its normal position and save this patient's vision. Um, and and to, to sort of, underline or underscore what a, a, a miraculous kind of surgery this is, you know, I'll tell you that that, you know, when I'm operating at the front of the eye, uh, corneas and cataracts, and I'll often operate with tolerances of maybe one millimeter, which means that my hand can't go one millimeter, you know, back or forward um, without making a mistake. So I have to keep it very steady. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mehta's hands have to be probably within a hundred microns, so a hundred thousandths of a millimeter um, to, to do the same, to have the same successful outcome. So again, this is a, a really remarkable surgery. These, these, patient, these uh, surgeons are doing just an awesome job here, um, but it can really show you that, you know, you don't want to be the, the patient in this position, right? You'd rather have better control of your sugars and never get into this uh, situation. So again, better control, I've emphasized that multiple times during this talk, with better control of the disease, we have better medicines and tools and technology, but they really not like to go to that second stage if we don't have to. Uh, but all of these add up to better vision for patients with diabetes. All right, so we have about 10, 15 minutes left. I'm gonna talk about uh, hypertensive retinopathy. So patients that develop retinal disease because of high blood pressure as well as embolic disease. 
Um, and so what you can see here is someone that has high blood pressure and has developed multiple um, uh, sequelae or multiple characteristics of patients who have high blood pressure in their retina. And you can see up in the right-hand corner here, you have something called a cotton wool spot. What that is is a white spot that appears when there's not enough blood flow to the retina, so it becomes swollen. You can get narrowing of the arteries. Sometimes when there's high blood pressure, the arteries start to, um, they, they overlap the, the veins here and they start to indent the veins. That's something called AV nicking. And similarly to diabetes where you have leaky blood vessels and you get that cholesterol and that fat that's leaking out of the blood, um, uh, out of the blood vessels, you can see that here in diabetes as well, or so you're here in high blood pressure as well. In more severe cases like this patient, you'll see optic nerve swelling, which usually indicates a very, that's like a high, high blood pressure emergency and the patient needs their blood pressure taken down, you know, ASAP, that's usually something, that's usually an emergency room consult. With, um, so I'll just say one more thing about high, hypertensive retinopathy, which is just that uh, patients that have this, you know, these, these, um, findings in the eye are usually a good indicator of control or not con good control of blood pressure. So if you have blood, high blood pressure and you see your ophthalmologist and they look at you and say, you know what, we're seeing some changes from high blood pressure, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to have an immediate effect on your vision, but it does mean that that's going to have a significant effect, potentially have a significant effect on your blood pressure or possible risk of stroke, um, heart attack, so it's important that if uh, you do have high blood pressure, you're seeing an ophthalmologist that can look at these things. And if, they, if you do have findings that those are communicated to your primary care doctor and your primary care doctor knows that they need to perhaps better control your blood pressure. Embolic disease. Um, so an emboli usually means that something breaks off within your bloodstream and then travels uh, through there, you know, your bloodstream your blood vessels are a little bit like branches of a tree. They kind of keep splitting and getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so if you have a clot, like a blood clot or a cholesterol plaque that breaks off, that can certainly um, travel down the bloodstream and eventually it'll kind of get lodged or and it'll start to clog the um, blood flow so that the blood can't travel further. And if that happens, you can have, if, for instance, if it happens in the brain, that can be a stroke. If it happens in the eye, you can get something similar. And what you'll see here on the left is just a, a basic and anatomical diagram of the blood vessels that lead to the eye. So one of those is the internal carotid artery, and that's probably you know, the most important artery supplying blood flow to your brain. And um, you, know, you hear about people getting something called a carotid endarterectomy. They go in and kind of roto-rooter out the uh, carotid vessel there and that relieves uh, some of the blockage. So sometimes patients that are having intermittent strokes will get that done. Um, but the first branch off of that carotid vessel is the ophthalmic artery, which goes directly to the eye. And so sometimes you'll get a break off of the plaque, say patients have high cholesterol, it's accumulating in their vessels here, um, a small plaque breaks off and it'll, it'll go. And as you see here, you see this is the small blood vessels within that orange retina that I described earlier, and you'll see that it's blocking blood flow. And that can actually cause a temporary reduction in vision. And that's something called amaurosis fugax. So what happens is that you'll get fleeting blindness. Usually it's in one eye, not both eyes. You'll get a dimming of the vision. So oftentimes people say that I felt like a gray curtain or a dark curtain fell over my vision and it stayed for a few minutes or a minute, and then it rise again, it rose again. And usually what that means is that the, when the um, clot or the cholesterol plaque blocks the blood flow, then there's no blood going to the retina, so it can't perceive light. So it, everything becomes dark. And then as the blood pressure builds up behind that clot, that clot or that plaque, it then kind of finally pushes it forward and then all of the blood flow goes through. And then all of a sudden your cells are seeing again. But you know, again, if that happens for too long a period, even if the blood flow is restored, you're not gonna get vision back. So if you are having any symptoms of this, where you see, you said, you know what, one eye, everything got dark for a little bit and then it got better, you need to discuss that with your primary care doctor 
And usually we involve a cardiologist as well. We wanna look for any heart arrhythmias, get, get uh, echocardiograms of the heart, get um, echoes of the, uh, of the carotid arteries. We wanna to look to make sure that there's nothing else going on. And so I'm gonna close here with autoimmune diseases in the eye. This is actually one of the areas, uh, besides being a cornea and cataract surgeon, um, I'm uh, also a specialist in, in these immune diseases that affect the eye. And um, so the important take home points here for uh, patients is that the eye can be evolved in a number of different diseases. Uh, the inflammation in the eye can sometimes be independent of the control of your systemic disease. So some patients that have rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, the rheumatologist tells them everything looks great, uh, you know, I don't know why you're having an eye problem. Your joints are fantastic. I'm, I'm doing a great job. But, you know, if the eyes are involved, that means that the underlying disease is not as well controlled as it should be, and we need to change therapy. The, likewise, you can have um, the joints can be really active and, and the eye may be fine. So they don't always go hand in hand. Um, lastly, if you have any, if you have an underlying autoimmune disease or rheumatic disease, like we talked about lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, and you have redness, pain, or change in vision in the eye, you need to have an evaluation with an ophthalmologist. Uh, again, this is that schematic of the uh, eye, and I'll show you how inflammation can affect various um, bits of your eye. So, um, First, this is how inflammation might affect the eye. We talk about um, something called scleritis, episcleritis, there's orbitopathy, optic neuritis, keratitis, uveitis, or retinal vasculitis. And I'll only discuss a few of these that may be most relevant to um, the majority of people that have autoimmune diseases. So the first thing we'll talk about is scleritis, which affects the white uh, wall of the eye, the outer coating, that's called the sclera. So interestingly, uh, the sclera is composed of the same material, collagen, as the bones and the joints. Uh, and it also has a unique blood supply that where there's a lot of stasis or not as much good movement between the arteries and the veins. So those two things, one, that your immune system, which may be attacking the collagen in your joints, doesn't really look at your eye as a different organ. It looks at it as, hey, that's another joint. It's, it's more collagen for me to, to attack. And so that's one reason why we oftentimes will get uh, eye disease in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Likewise, um, that change, that blood supply, where you don't have as much good or as good blood flow between the arteries and the veins means that any inflammatory um, mediators or proteins that are floating around in your bloodstream when you're inflamed, they can get clogged in those areas in the sclera and that can then result in more inflammation in that area. Two of the most common uh, causes of, of scleritis and episcleritis in patients that have these diseases, uh, have an underlying systemic disease, which is about less, a little less than half, have rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease. So things like Crohn's disease, or ulcerative colitis. Episcleritis, which you heard me mention about, is an inflammation of the superficial layer of the eye wall. It's generally can it form a red eye. It's usually not painful. Patients um, can be treated with eye drops, and sometimes it just gets better by itself. And it's usually not of any concern in terms of the uh, effect on the eye health or on your um, general health, but it can be unsightly and can be irritating to patients. More concerning is if you have scleritis, which is an uh, inflammation of the deeper layer of the white wall of the eye. And oftentimes this is painful or tender. Patients, you know, if you try to touch it, patients usually jump out of the chair um, and they oftentimes will say they have a headache on that side. So if you have a headache and a red eye, definitely come in to see your ophthalmologist, um, especially if you have an, if you have an underlying uh, condition. Oftentimes this will require systemic treatment, meaning that just using eye drops may not help. Patients may need uh, things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Um, you know, the ibuprofen or Aleve can help. Sometimes they need steroids. There are two specific types of uh, scleritis which can affect the eye and can be very severe. These include things like uh, scleral necrosis, which means that the tissue is actually dying in that area. 
um, and scleromalacia perforans. Many, both of these are, associ are associated with more severe autoimmune diseases. And these can often indicate that the patient has um, a poor chance of survival. So these can be signs that the general disease is not well controlled and needs to be um, better controlled with other medications. I'll skip this slide here. We'll talk about keratitis, which can affect the cornea. That's the front of the eye. So peripheral ulcerative keratitis is an inflammation of that cornea, that clear tissue on the front of the eye. And most often is associated with uh, something called rheumatoid arthritis, but this can generally cause inflammation in the eye. Most patients with rheumatoid arthritis will complain about irritation, redness, tearing, sometimes pain. Um, but it can ultimately cause a severe loss in vision because what happens is that your immune system is attacking the cornea. The cornea is only about five to 600 micrometers thick. That's five to 600 thousandths of a millimeter. It's essentially a sheet of paper. And so if the immune system is attacking it and it's destroying that tissue, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner and it's potential, it, there's potential for it to form a hole. And if that happens, you can lose vision or even lose the eye itself. So here is a patient who had uh, rheumatoid arthritis and developed uh, inflammation. And you can actually see this brown area here, this sort of circle is actually the iris. The colored part of the eye has moved forward to plug that hole. Um, that's just a natural defense mechanism of the body. Uh, but you could see that this perforated. So this, the immune system, the blood vessels are bringing all the immune cells here. It's caused thinning, which has caused destruction of that tissue. And um, now there's a hole and it's being plugged up by the, the pupil or not the pupil, but the iris. So when patients have this, that's an emergency. We take patients to the operating room. You can see here in this photo in A um, that there is a hole here in the, in the eye and we patch it. So we use sclera or white, the white wall from uh, someone that has passed away. They've donated their cornea and their sclera and this is the corneal tissue here. And we place it over kind of like a patch like you would over say a hole in your jeans and we, we, so, we suture it in place and that uh, saves the patient's eye and saves the patient's vision. So as I said, rheumatoid arthritis is probably um, one of the more common conditions that uh, we see in terms of its effect on the eyes. Uh, dry eye is the most common um, side effect with that or eye, eye manifestation. And so we usually recommend patients, uh, I'll go into treatment on, in a second, but we also talked about uh, scleritis and episcleritis, which are inflammations of the wall of the eye. Those can also cause um, pain, reduction in vision, loss of the eye. And this is a patient with scleritis and rheumatoid arthritis. So you can see the inflammation in all different gazes, all parts of the eye. And we treated the patient with uh, steroids and you can see that they're, they're much, much better here. Um, so we significantly improved this patient's uh, well-being through the use of medication. As I was saying before, we can use multiple different regimens to treat dry eye, and especially here in Southern California, dry eye is, is a significant problem. Um, but we can use artificial tears. We can use punctal plugs. So we have tear ducts here that drain our tears in the corner of our eyelids. We can place small plugs similar to what you would do in a bathtub drain to keep your own tears on the eye longer. Um, we can also add certain types of uh, prescription medications. One's called Zydra or Lefitograst, another one's called Restasis or Cyclosporin. And there are a few other Cyclosporin things like, like Sequa uh, that can be added. And those can actually reduce inflammation and as well as treating the dry eye. Let me just take a look here. So we're running about five minutes over time. I'm going to just stop here. Um, so that we'll have a chance to uh, ask questions. Um, the only thing I'll mention uh, just before stopping here is that there is something called uveitis, which is inflammation in the middle of the eye. It comes from the word, Greek word uvea, which means grape. That was sort of the inner layer of the eye. And patients with uveitis are at risk of blindness. 
Um, it can sometimes cause pain, redness, light sensitivity, floaters, spots in the eye, or decreased vision. Sometimes people will have flashes of light. Um, if that happens, we can generally treat it, but it is important that we treat that uh, adequately and appropriately, and we're aggressive about it because uh, that can definitely cause permanent vision loss in the eye. So again, treatment of eye inflammation can be both local, meaning eye drops, or systemic. We can treat patients with steroid tablets, non-steroidal tablets like Aleve or ibuprofen. Um, and sometimes we have to put patients on systemic treatment. So sometimes we have to give them um, almost like chemotherapy, things like methotrexate or uh, Humira, many of you may be familiar with from advertisements on TV. Those can actually treat inflammation. And many times the dose of the treatment, uh, the dose of the treatment needs to be higher for, for eye disease than it does for the rest. So sometimes whatever is working for your joints may not work as well for the eyes and the dose may need to be increased. And so I'll stop there. Uh, I wanna thank you again for uh, joining us today. I, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to interact with all of you. I, I know I speak for Dr. Rao and uh, all of the faculty here at uh, the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute in doing that. And uh, I'll turn it over now to Dana, who I think will, uh, and Alex will be able to sort of give us or, or relay the questions. That's great. Thank you both, Dr. Kadar and Dr. Rao. That was fabulous. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat, so I will go ahead and start with the first one. Um, uh, one of our guests asked, how does having a previous RK surgery affect cataract surgery? Uh, mind if I take that, Kavita? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so RK, you know, one of the, when we remove the cataract, we put an artificial lens at the eye. And artificial lenses come in different sizes. And so it's almost like shoes, they're whole and half sizes. And when we do that, we take several measurements of the eye and we run it through these computerized calculations to, to decide what lens we should put in your eye. Well, patients that have RK, they're corny. So, excuse me, let me backtrack just a second. Part of the measurement is the distance from the front of the eye to the back of the eye. And the other part of that is actually the shape of the front of the eye. So when we calculate all of these, um, when we make these measurements, patients with RK have an altered cornea shape. The, all, the front of the eye is different. And so that throws off some of the calculations. We've gotten better over the years. I mean, since I first started practicing almost 20 years ago, we, we have much better machines, much better ways to calculate how the patient, um, how well we can get sort of meet the target for the power of the lens and accomplish what the patient wants to see. Um, but I always tell patients with uh, RK that are having cataract surgery that it will take you longer to get a stable vision and to recover vision than it does for the average cataract patient. And rarely you have to go back in and change the lens or, or alter it. So um, you know, it, there are many things that can also occur in the operating room as well. Um, some of those RK incisions are deep. They can break open in the middle of surgery. But um, all of those things, you know, a, a good cataract surgeon will take those into account. And um, I, I think if you're having cataract surgery today, having had RK in the past, you're in a much better position than you were, uh, say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but it's by no means perfect. Another question that came in says, our son had laser vision, had laser vision surgery a few, a few years ago. He consistently has dry eyes. Uh, what eye specialist should he see? So sometimes, unfortunately, um, any laser or any treatment sometimes that we do to the front of the eye can exacerbate or can cause dry eyes. Um, so I see a lot of dry eye patients. I would be happy to see him. If it's something more um, specific, I can always send him to one of our specialists. But if it is dry eyes, I see a lot of that and I'd be happy to treat him and um, see him. Um, another question. It was mentioned that many of the age-related diseases have no painful symptoms. Therefore, regular preventative screening is necessary. 
Is the detachment of the retina for the diabetic patient's case painful for the patient? So um, unfortunately, detachment of the retina is not painful, but you'll have vision, um, you'll see visual disturbance, or you might see what we say, like a curtain coming over your vision. Some people might notice new floaters or new spots. They might see flashing lights. Um, so no pain, but you most likely will have some sort of visual disturbance. Uh, the vision won't be as good as you normally see, or you might see some of those symptoms that I mentioned. Um, I'm also reading, are optometrists involved in any treatment or maintenance? Um, optometrists, I always tell my patients, are much better at us than doing glasses, than doing prescriptions for glasses and contact lenses. Um, that's the reason they went to optometry schools to do refractive uh, things such as glasses. Um, and they could probably do a general eye exam, but in terms of medical treatment, they're different than the ophthalmologist because ophthalmologists went to medical school and so were more involved with medical treatment of diseases and how it relates to the body. Um, so if it was a medical issue, I would definitely see an ophthalmologist, but if it was a pure glasses, um, optometrists are fine. Uh, does marijuana use negatively affect the eye? So I'll uh, give you the, I'll take this just as, as a as a plug, you know, I, I, as a plug for our glaucoma service here, I'll tell you that uh, Dr. Mosayed, who's the head of the glaucoma service, actually has run the only placebo-controlled trial of marijuana use for glaucoma. This is a question that's been asked for decades, um, and found that although it did seem to lower the pressure in the eye uh, temporarily, uh, the amount that you would need to do that, you would have to basically be, you know inhaling or smoking marijuana constantly in order to maintain uh, a pressure, a beneficial pressure uh, to prevent glaucoma. In terms of an adverse effect or negative, negative effect, you know, marijuana use, obviously, uh, a lot of people are aware of the, the um, side effect of red eyes that occur, um, but dryness can occur also. So I think most of it seems to be a similar um, negative effect as you would have with Nicotine spoke in terms of the surface of the eye, causing um, irritation to the eye, dry eyes. Uh, I think both of those things can, can be harmful. But you know, for the back of the eye, there's not that much uh, in terms of the retina or the optic nerve, development of cataracts, there's not that much that's really known uh, specifically about uh, those effects. Um, uh, someone else says, you mentioned lifestyle options for implantable lenses. What are these options and does Medicare cover all intraocular lenses? You know, there are um, different, so in terms of lifestyle options, basically the options that we have for, for cataract surgery in terms of different lenses, um, the idea is to reduce your dependence on glasses and to become more spectacle independent. Uh, however, we can't guarantee that you'll be completely independent of glasses uh, for every patient. For, for many or the majority, we are able to get them into that range, um, but not everyone. And so um, the, uh, the options are, you can have something called a multifocal lens, which gives you uh, a range of vision, both for close, intermediate, and distance vision. Uh, there are also what's called extended depth of field lenses, which give you more of an intermediate to distance vision. Um, and then there are also something, there's also something called the toric lens, which uh, can correct astigmatism. And astigmatism is uh, sort of the front of the eye is curved a little bit differently in one direction than another. The cornea is, is misshapen. And we can use, that can cause blurred vision for both distance and close. And by using these special lenses, we can correct that to provide better vision for the patient after surgery. Not every patient that comes in is a good candidate for this. And there are certainly both uh, advantages and disadvantages to each of the, the lifestyle lenses, which uh, should be discussed with you when you're considering cataract surgery. Um, Medicare doesn't, co doesn't cover the lifestyle lenses. Medicare typically covers what are called monofocal lenses, which give you good vision at a particular distance. So you, you either say, I'd like to see good, see well at distance and wear glasses for near, or I'd like to see well at near without glasses and wear glasses for far away. 
Um, and that's typically the lens that Medicare will cover. Is there any eye examination uh, that can predict if one would suffer NAION or not? So um, we can't predict if anyone is going to specifically get the NAION, but if someone has suffered it, we can definitely tell on examination the way that the nerve looks and certain testing that we do um, that can let us know if there has been damage to the nerve from NAION. Um, in general, there are risk factors to developing NAION, such as small optic nerves, but we can't predict just because someone has a small optic nerve, they won't necessarily suffer from NAION. Uh, the next question says, I have UC. Sometimes I have double vision and I'm not able to read for a short time. I've noticed this happens when I'm looking at my cell phone, FaceTime, or read an article. I do have floaters. I have consulted ophthalmologists, and I don't have a good answer. Please advise. So I think uh, in this situation, I, I doubt that the ulcerative colitis has, has any particular bearing on, on the symptoms. Um, you know, some people do, what I would advise is probably having a good evaluation with someone that specializes in eye movement. Um, sometimes patients, when they're looking at things close up, you know, when, you know, all of us normally, when we look at things close up, our eyes actually will move in a little bit. And some patients, you know, as they get older, or for whatever reason, the eyes don't move in equally, or they don't move in as much as they should. And so patients can get double vision that way. Um, the other thing is that some, if it's occurring with just one eye, right, like if you cover one eye and the double vision goes away, that usually means it's an eye muscle problem. If you cover one eye or the other eye and it's still there, sometimes that can be due to an, uh, what they call a refractive error or something that's uh, either glasses or dry eye or cataracts can cause that uh, within the eye itself. Uh, if you see an ophthalmologist and they've looked at the eyes and they haven't been able to see an issue, um, I probably would advise maybe seeing someone, again, if you cover one eye and it goes away or cover the other eye, it goes away. I'd advise seeing someone that specializes in eye muscle movements. So that's something called strabismus. Um, and sometimes that can be very situational and it can only occur, like you said, with reading or FaceTime or cell phone. Um, and it's important to kind of have the, have the doctor evaluate you uh, while doing those activities so they can actually see what's going on. Great. I think those were the last questions in the chat, unless anybody else has something. Uh, you can raise your hand, I believe, and we could unmute you. Um, but otherwise, we have uh, gone a bit over this evening. Um, but we thank everybody for attending. And if you have any questions, you can email us and we can direct your questions to these uh, two doctors or uh, to the uh, uh, appointment line. So I'll put the uh, email address in the chat. And if you have any other questions that we can forward on to anybody, please let us know. Uh, we do have another um, lecture coming up um, in November on uh, keratoconus. So if you're interested, oh, we have a hand raised. So hold on one second. Let's see. Uh, I think you're unmuted. Yes, right now um, you're unmuted. Yeah, I just have a question. Is there any alternative to FA test, F fluorescent angiogram uh, test, or just uh, is there any alternative to this test? Uh, yeah, there, so you know, nowadays uh, there's something called uh, OCT angiography. And so uh, if you remember from the one of the slides I showed had a sort of these black and white stripes that indicated the levels of the retina or the, the cells of the retina. They've come up with a way to use that same technology to look at blood vessels. It can't, it still can't tell everything. So there still is a place for fluorescein angiography, but for many patients with uh, macular degeneration and even for some patients with diabetes, uh, using OCT angiography can actually take the place of the fluorescein angiogram. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have one more hand. Um, let's see. For Renee, I believe we've asked you to unmute. Not allowing. Oh, there we go. I unmuted. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned surgery for chronic dry eye. I have had dry eye for at least five years. I've been using Rostasis, Zydra, and also Serum Tears, but I haven't heard of actual surgery for dry eye. What would that entail? I don't, uh, I don't know that I mentioned surgery for dry eye. If, if I did, I, I misspoke and I apologize. Oh. <laughs> um, there are, there are, no, no, I will tell you that there are some certain cases of dry eye, something called neurotrophic keratitis, where there's a lack of uh, innervation or nerves that are going to the eye uh, mm -hmm. for trauma or other diseases, where we are actually able to take um, the nerve from up here and reroute it into the cornea. That is a surgery that can be used for that particular condition, but that's really specific. So again, my apologies. Um, any other conditions for dry, any other surgeries for dry eye, I would say would be things like, uh, you can cauterize the puncta, so you can actually like kind of burn the, the drainage canal within the eyelid here to close it, but that's similar to what would be done with the punctal plug. Uh, sometimes uh, certain patients will also close the eyelids. So we'll, you know, uh, suture part or stitch part of the eyelids together to reduce the exposure that the eye has to the air. That also can help alleviate some dry eye symptoms. But mm -hmm. those are typically used in more extreme cases rather than um, more routine cases. I would suggest if you're if you've been using restasis, you haven't had any any you know beneficial effect or haven't felt the effect. Um, two things that could be considered would be, one is a, a drug called Zydra, which is newer on the market. Again, some people tolerate it, some people don't. There's also something called uh, autologous serum tears, which are where we, a company will come and, and draw your own blood, make that into uh, eye drops, uh, taking out the red blood cells, and then uh, you can apply those to your eyes. And, and I've had several patients uh, who went uh, with, who when they didn't respond to other conditions uh, or under other treatments responded very well to uh, serum. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Godar and Dr. Rao for this lecture tonight. Great, thank you very much. Thank right. you for joining us. Have a good evening. Thanks.